All right. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for you know taking part in this learning uh, opportunity, courtesy of Bradley Clark. I'm so excited to introduce you all to Bradley, someone who I've gotten to know over the months um, as we worked really closely together to launch uh, the NFT project that many of you are familiar with called the Tuttle Tribe. Um, Bradley, if you could go to the next slide, I just want to do a quick overview of who Web3 Equity is and what Tuttle Tribe is um, for the folks that, that have not met us yet. Uh, so my name is Michelle Abs, and I am the founder of Web3 Equity. And really our mission with Web3 Equity is to ensure gender equity in Web3. Um, we know that this has not always been the case in different you know, moments of technological innovation and some groups are left behind. Um, and we believe that if we educate and onboard more women to Web3 and we engage our male allies, we can actually achieve that vision of equity in Web3. And so we do that by offering learning opportunities like this one today. Uh, we host various in-person learning events as well. We've done those in LA, in New York, in Miami, in Austin. Um, and we are excited to offer that in-person learning environment along with the virtual learning environment. And my career, I've been an educator um, my, my whole career. And so I think many of us, as we start to pique our curiosity around Web3, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, but those resources aren't always aligned to like the best types of learning pedagogy and the best practices for learning for adults. And so what we're really doing with Web3 Equity is employing this model to help you understand these somewhat complex topics most simply and to retain the knowledge so that then you can take whatever action in Web3 you like. Um, and so if you are not part of our tribe yet, we would love for you to join us. The NFT is a beautiful piece of artwork that was created by Emmy-winning artist Amaranta Martinez, who's Venezuelan-born but Miami-bred. And uh, that piece of beautiful art unlocks the utility to be able to attend the sessions like today and the other events in person, um, all free of charge. So if you have not jumped into our Tuttle tribe yet, um, we really encourage you to do that today. There's the QR code on the screen um, so you can head over to that link in Mint. And we actually made it extra easy so that you can Mint uh, from your credit card. So all you need is a digital wallet and you are able to join our wonderful learning community together um, by simply having that credit card do the transaction for you. So all of that and all of that NFT beauty is made possible by the man, the myth, the legend, Bradley Clark. Um, and so I'm really excited to introduce you all to our speaker and educator and who's gonna walk us through everything today. Um, Bradley was the um, developer on our team who made this all possible. And he is a Web3 developer, you know, who has a shop. He's able to partner with different Web3 projects and companies um, for their engineering needs on the back end. So um, he's going to share with you today um, the nuts and bolts of ERC721, um, you know, how to build smart contracts and how to read um, that on the Etherscan uh, transaction history. So uh, without further ado, uh, Bradley, I'm going to pass it over to you. I'm going to pin you here. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we can get right to it. All right. So learning outcomes for the day. Learn to read a Solidity contract, at least a little bit. Uh, we're going to equip ourselves to understand EtherScan, what's most important and high impact there. Um, we're going to understand some of the methods that developers like me and others uh, use to keep their contracts safe and secure. Um, and we're also going to talk about what is an ERC721 NFT anyway. Um, so let's get right into it. At a high level, you all know what an ERC721 is. It's a non-fungible token. Specifically, ERC721 refers to the standard, which we're going to talk about in a second here. Um, fungible, what does fungible even mean? Um, a lot of people like just stumble over this right at the beginning. Um, 
fungible is like um, fungible is like a dollar bill that has a number on it, right? Like all of our dollar bills have a serial number. But if you go to uh, McDonald's, like no one, they're not going to sit there and look at the numbers and say like, oh, I can't take this one. Do you have one that ends in a nine? Right. So that's fungible where there's a lot of things that have different IDs, but we don't really care as long as they're you know in the same set. Non-fungible is the converse of that. So non-fungible is like the number of it actually matters. Um, it's even if there's a series of them that look similar, uh, they are going to be unique each and every one. Um, so that's a very high level explanation of fungibility. Um, and you know them today as uh, primarily a wrapper for art. Um, everything from uh, CryptoKitties, one of the earliest, most popular NFTs, um, the profile photos that you see that are really common. Um, up in the top here, I have a fine art, one of my favorite fine art NFTs um, that actually mutates over time. Um, and then there's also some deeper artwork, uh, some, some deeper things that can be done with NFTs as well. Everything from uh, like experiences that engage at different levels to using an NFT to represent like um, potentially a, 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 like a negative value asset. <laughs> Uh, so like represent the, like a mortgage as an example. Um, so let's see, next slide. Uh, I got so much going on the screen here. Okay, so ERC721, here's, I'm not gonna make this super technical, but it is definitely a little bit technical. Um, so uh, the, this on the right side is a screen cap um, from the original post of the ERC721 standard. So um, this is, uh, the board is called like Ethereum request for comment. And in the Ethereum world, there are thousands of these that have been submitted over time for di various different token standards. Um, standards are really important. That's how we achieve interoperability. You know, in Ethereum, one of the greatest things about uh, blockchain overall is that anybody from anywhere can contribute in very serious and significant ways. Well, how do you make sure that everyone is able to basically uh, put their boat in the water and start sailing in the same direction? Standards. So the standards kind of accrue on this board. Um, it's the EAPS board, the Ethereum Improvement Proposal Standard. <laughs> um, anyway, so what you actually see here in the ERC itself is the interfaces for the contract. Um, and really importantly, um, in the original specification for this, it talks about uh, what the names of the methods in the specification need to be. And it talks about um, what those things should do, but the specification itself does not contain any implementation details. So this, we're, we're gonna go into this on the next slide. Um, or very soon. So people can implement these contracts any number of ways, right? Like coding, you want the outcome to be the same all the time, but what happens under the hood um, is different based on every team that actually writes the code to execute the different, um, uh, the different interactions uh, that the contract sees. Um, so one thing that I'll just jump ahead a little bit, we're gonna talk about what that contract actually looks like and where it lives, but just so everyone's clear, um, this code gets written on a developer's computer and then it gets deployed to Ethereum mainnet or some other chain. Um, and then once the contract is on the network, um, it's just there on its own doing its thing, following the instructions that the developer put in place. Um, so, there's a lot of things to look out for when you're dealing with uh, NFTs, ERC-721s, um, and a few key ways to keep the team safe or to keep yourself safe, I should say. Um, so first of all, uh, when I'm investigating a new NFT, uh, one of my things is looking at the team. So um, level one of looking at the team is, are there names and faces attached? It's much harder to go out and be malicious, uh, any number of ways to be malicious in this space, uh, harder to be malicious if your name and face are attached, uh, right? Because then you like literally have to escape or just deal with angry mobs uh, on Twitter all the time. Um, so level two of the team is looking at past projects, checking out their Twitter, seeing what else they've been involved in, 
seeing how many people you know in common. Um, one way I evaluate an NFT for investment is which of the people I follow in tw on Twitter already follow the project or the people involved. Um, then the next thing you can do, um, if you're really like, on, if you wanna make another level of validation is to check the contract. And we're gonna show you how to do that in a little bit. Um, another really important thing is to look for GitHub. Um, so in the, the most Web3 thorough ethos driven pro products, um, again, coming back to the idea of openness and allowing anybody to participate, um, most of the projects post their items on GitHub uh, publicly. So um, look for a link to GitHub on the site. Not everybody does this and it's not mandatory, but it's another vote of confidence in the project. Um, and then when you do find the contracts, whether that's on Etherscan or on GitHub, look for the use of contracts from a respected organization. Uh, so this is where actually I need to reshare my screen, I think. So okay. we're doing number three or number two or three of uh, what Bradley showed. You know, if you are considering buying a Tuttle NFT, we're actually going to walk you through the contract. So you're already seeing the team. <laughs> and now we're going to, you know, walk you through the contract as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So, oops. Sorry, everybody. That's okay. I think most of us don't know what this says anyways. <laughs> About to show the contracts. Uh... Got it. All right. I cleaned up my desktop a little too vigorously earlier. <laughs> Get rid of that. There we go. Okay. So this is the Tuttle Tribe contract. Um, one thing you'll see here is all these import statements just right at the beginning. Um, and on the last slide, when I said a thing to look for is um, reuse of contracts from uh, an existing organization. Um, open Zeppelin is a provider that writes open source version implementations of common ERCs. So, you know, the process starts with one developer or a team of developers saying like, here's a new kind of token that we want to invent and here's how it works. Here's everything that it should and should not do. Um, and then from there, uh, anyone's able to actually implement them themselves. But in the community, there's a couple of organizations that do have these kind of canonical or um, implementations and Open Zeppelin is one of them. So uh, typically it's a really good sign if you do see Open Zeppelin because for a few reasons. So um, for one, uh, we've all heard about contracts getting audited and some projects do get audited, some do not. Um, there's no better audit than having a contract deployed live in front of everybody, right? So um, anytime I as a developer can go to Open Zeppelin, I know these contracts have been deployed hundreds, probably thousands of times. Um, and if there's all these contracts holding so much money um, and people, you know, Anything, any contract sitting out there on Ethereum is just a honeypot waiting to get hacked, right? Like it's just a matter of time unless it's totally perfect. So with the Open Zeppelin contracts that have been deployed so many times, um, I can be pretty confident knowing that, you know, if the biggest projects in the space use Open Zeppelin and they have not been attacked, hacked, whatever, um, then anything that I do also is exactly the same and also uh, pretty safe. So. Um, looking for uh, an example from another organization. And actually, I have one other example I wanted to show you. Um, so this is a um, contract that I worked on with Common Stack last year. Uh, it's called the Augmented Bonding Curve. Um, and again, their imports, uh, what they're doing, what, what, what they're doing in this contract is way more complex than just a simple 721. But again, a lot of what they're doing is importing from Aragon, which um, was, they've disbanded now, but for a long time, they were one of the leaders in um, creating DAO software. So again, just another, you know, contract that uses uh, extensive imports. Okay, let's get into this a little bit. So right here at the top, uh, we have, so this, um, 
real quick function here is a proxy registry. So I don't know if you've noticed, um, if you want to go and um, resell your Tuttle Tribe NFT on the secondary on OpenSea, um, there's usually a step in there uh, that does create a transaction uh, that comes with a transaction cost to permit OpenSea to operate on your NFT. Um, so in the contract, what we've gone ahead and done is whitelisted the OpenSea contract so that uh, when you go through there, there's not that additional expense of having to say like, okay, I will permit OpenSea to resell this if I want. Um, we can trust OpenSea pretty well because again, large company, long history, um, and uh, but I wouldn't add just random contracts into this because that does open the door. It's, it's a minor vulnerability. Um, but then again, if, if OpenSea gets hacked, then we are all in some big trouble. Uh, okay, another thing I wanna point out here, Tuttle Tribe V2 is the name of this particular contract. So we've already upgraded this contract once and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and I don't, I can spend a long time talking about this. We're not gonna go line by line, but I was pointing out some of the big things. So um, this is a hint here that the contract has been upgraded and I'll get into that more when we talk about Etherscan. Um, you also see this declaration that it is all of these other contracts. That's just these ones that we're importing up here. Again, you know, if you're looking for vulnerabilities, a good thing to look at is the imports. If you see something you're not familiar with, that might be a clue uh, that there's a contract you should go look at. Um, imports are the best way to sneak um, exploits into uh, anything technical. And if we find those imported, so here you used Open Zeppelin, you referred to another um, import that, that was a trusted one. Um, and for the most part, those imports that you've used that are trusted have been audited, correct? In that um, suite of- Yes, the Open Zeppelin ones definitely have been audited. Um, the Aragon ones, I know the auditor, I know they were audited. Um, we can't automatically assume that anything that's imported has been audited. Um, but, you know, it's just, if you want to do some investigation, uh, this is the start of the trail. Um, and usually the organization should be, you might, you're probably not going to put on their website that the contracts are audited, but you could probably ask the team. Although if you ask too many questions, they might think you're a hacker and tell you to go away. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a balance. Um, all right, so here up at the top is kind of declaring our, our base constants um, for, the, uh, for the contract itself. Um, you'll see, you know, pretty typical stuff. This proxy registry, added, I'm, I'm not gonna do every single one. Um, the base price is the base price. Um, the Merkle root is interesting. We're gonna get to that in a second, but this is part of our process for um, making the whitelists efficient. Um, and then we have two lists in here. So we have team minters and day of minters. Basically, this is an address and it just, um, in advance, we had two buckets. We had people who were uh, part of Tuttle Tribe from the very beginning. And then we had people who were allowed to mint um, first. And so this is where we're just setting up the list of who belongs in um, each of those and they get updated further down. So many of you know, you've probably sent your wallet in to be on an allow list, right? So here's the back end of what that looks like when you send your wallet in, then you know that you are on one of these lists of however those are being designated. Exactly. Yep. That's it. Um, let's see. So the initializer, um, most, uh, most contracts are going to have either a constructor or an initializer. Uh, we have an initializer because that's part of the upgrade pattern uh, in this contract, um, but a constructor. So these are functions. These are things that happen only one time and only when the contract is deployed. So anything that's in here can be considered more or less permanent. Um, very difficult to change, at least. Uh, you'll see the name of the, the token and the symbol. Um, you'll see a bunch of calls to the different contracts that we're importing specifying exactly which contract is allowed to operate. This is the OpenSea contract I mentioned. The base price has this phenomenally long number uh, because when you're dealing in a contract, um, everything starts with uh, the base unit of Ethereum, which is not actually Ether, it's way. So um, I think there's uh, 18, well, how many is that? There's 15 or 18 decimal points of precision um, in Ethereum. And so for, 
0.05 ETH. We're actually not going to use decimals. Mm. Ethereum does not like decimals, makes this whole process very fun. Um, so we have to go to you know this many way. Um, let's see, total supply is 30, 50. Like we know, um, there's a cap on how many the whitelist can mint before it goes to public. Right here, we actually have, um, this is something to, to look out for, right? Um, so in the initializer, we're already doing some logic. When you see four, uh, for loop is something that's just like, for every item in a list, it's gonna do something else. Um, so here, oops, here right at the beginning when we deploy the contract, we're actually minting um, 80 of these to the team wallet. Uh, that's fairly standard, but again, like if you wanna see what's going on behind the scenes, take a look, find the loops for if and else are kind of the keywords on those. Um, let's skip the uh, whitelist mint and go straight to the batch mint down here, actually. So, um, cause they do, do basically both the same thing. So this is the, the main, uh, actually, no, we'll do, we'll do whitelist so I can talk about the actually checking the whitelist. So first thing, you know, these requires are statements that like these, um, these, uh, settings or circumstances, these, these states have to be true in order for the program to proceed. So if you're doing contracts, sorry, if you're doing transactions on Ethereum anywhere and you get an error where it's just like um, error with the contract, it's probably failing on a require statement somewhere in there. So the first thing is like, it has to be live. Uh, this whitelist mint says, yeah, we're in um, allow list state uh, status. For require, uh, oh yeah, we weren't allowing people to mint more than five in one transaction. So we need to make sure that this count is uh, five. Ooh, I missed the declaration. So um, on the whitelist, we're looking for two pieces of information. We're looking for the count. That's gonna be how many you want to mint. And we're looking for this funky thing, this bytes 32 proof. Um, and that's our checker uh, that will allow us to see who is on the list. Um, Let's see, so here we're checking if they're on the team minters list, then this set of logic applies. Uh, so you'll actually kind of see each indent is its own set of logic. Um, inside of the team minters, if we, get a, if we get a transaction from an address that is on that team minters list, uh, we take a look at what the token ID, uh, um, oh, we set what the token ID that we're about to mint is going to be. Then we just make sure that the uh, token ID is less than the total supply because we don't want to mint more than 3,050 of these. Um, then we're going to count up, and just get ready for the next mint right here. Um, and then safe mint. So this is actually the first function that we're seeing that is in the ERC standard. Um, safe mint does a couple of things. It creates a new token and it sends it to an address. And then it checks that that address is able to receive a token, uh, an NFT. So, you know, usually just a standard wallet address, that's fine. Um, but what we're preventing here is we don't want um, this to get minted to a non-Ethereum address. And we don't want this to get minted and sent to um, a contract that is another contract, right? Like um, if... The Tunnel Tribe tries to send an NFT to the Bored Apes contract, well, it's just going to get lost um, and no one will ever be able to get to it because the Bored Apes contract doesn't have anything to say like, let's take the NFT out of this contract. So just doing a check there to make sure everything's on the rails. Um, wow, that's actually, I just want to pause right there because I think that's that's a, a very thoughtful addition that not all contracts have. I've actually heard of a couple friends who, oh, I accidentally sent in my Solana wallet when I was trying to do a Ethereum mint. And then if you don't have this safe mint statement within your contract, that will actually get eaten. That will get sent, right? So so this is a very you know thoughtful addition that Bradley worked in for us to make sure we were extra safe. Exactly. Got to make sure nothing can go wrong. Not, no room for error on this. Um, team mentors. So what we're doing here is you came in, uh, the, the transaction came in. We saw that you were on the list of the team mentors. Um, we only want this to, um, we only want people on this particular list to be able to go through this portion of the flow one time. So here we say like, okay, we're, we saw you, um, you wouldn't, we, we, you were valid when you came in here once. Now we're basically like stamping your pass and setting you to false um, so that you can't just like run through this again. 
Um, so for the count here, we're going to do this. Um, the count came at the very top. That's how many we want to mint. So we want to make sure that the message value, anything, uh, anything that starts with MSG, is uh, that means message, and that's the actual transaction that was sent from the wallet to the contract. So we want to make sure that inside that transaction message from the wallet into the contract, that the value of Ethereum that came with it, um, we're, we're checking that value, and then we're dividing it by the base price that we already talked about, that like 50 billion or whatever it was, uh, way, and then um, making sure that we're that there's enough money to go along with all this. Uh, to, to complete the transaction. Um, and then here, ah, yes, okay. So the safe mint, people on the team mint list, um, again, people who are with the project from day one, uh, they got one token free. So right here, we did um, one token for free. Um, and then we come down here and if, if you wanted to mint more uh, after your free one, we do a little check and make sure that, um, uh, this is where the, the rest of the minting takes place. So if you come in and you want to mint five, um, we're going to take that count number here um, and loop through this a bunch of times. So uh, again, each time we have to set what token ID we're about to mint. Um, we're going to check and make sure that we're not minting more than 3,050. We're going to um, increase the number on the current token count, um, just setting it up for the next mint uh, because you know these things can come in simultaneously. So we do it right here. And again, we're gonna safe mint for the rest of what's um, in your count. Uh, and then at the very end, it's a return. That means um, now this path through this function is done and the transaction can be successful. Um, if you came in through this path and you weren't on the list, you would fall into the else bucket, which is pretty similar. Um, we're checking the message value and the base price again. Um, Let's see, we're gonna make sure that you're not just trying to, um, oh, this is an interesting one. So uh, the count for you has to be greater than zero, right? So we don't want you to initiate a transaction to us uh, with a zero count, because that will just drain your wallet of gas as the transaction processes. So we're gonna interrupt it right away and say like, hey, something's wrong, go back and uh, try again. So this is on our mint page, correct, Bradley, where there's a number, right? And mm. if you if you go down and you select zero, so this is this would trigger that statement, correct? Exactly. Yep. Um technically the, the zero path is in here. So just just because there's a, I want to be really clear. Um the zero for the people on the team list, the zeroth one came for free. Um, for everyone else, you need one to five to, to proceed. Um, down here, this is where we're actually checking who's on the list. Um, and I won't talk, well, I wanna cover this really briefly. There's a very fun data structure in Ethereum called Merkle proofs. Uh, basically it's a compression method uh, and this saves on gas. So um, instead of creating a list of like thousands of wallet addresses that are going to be on the whitelist for the mint, um, and then making the contract loop through potentially thousands of different um, numbers uh, that all takes gas. Uh, we've actually compressed it. And now we're just going to, um, un basically what it does is it creates a big old, uh, instead of having a list like this of all the wallet addresses, um, they all get laid out like this and kind of bundled up into a nested tree structure. Um, and then we can just take a shortcut really fast to find um, the reference of which part of the tree your wallet address is in. Um, and then uh, basically it uses a complex form of factoring from algebra uh, to, to verify whether or not your address matches that place in the list. Um, I think that's a, a good explanation of Merkle trees. Um, and then here you'll see the exact same mint um, loop as before. So, so that's minting, that was the whitelist. That's what was active from, I think, 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Uh, on the release day. And then after that, we changed it over to batch mint. Um, and I won't go into this because uh, it's effectively this, it's very similar to what we just talked about, um, but for the public, so we're not checking the whitelist or anything like that. Um, a bit further down, we get into some of the other things that uh, the contract does. So, um, 
Here we have add team mentors. This is where we actually add people to that list. Um, and we built it so that we can add multiple at once if we want to. That's why there's a for loop. Um, here's set Merkle root. So of that tree structure that I talked about, um, the factoring takes, uh, uh, there's a very first initial um, root at the very top of the tree. Uh, maybe I'm drawing this, maybe it should be like this, but anyway, there's a, a, a root that everything gets factored in with. Um, it's one of the, so that we have a constant for one of the variables that we need to evaluate when we find, when we look for those addresses in the Merkle tree. Um, here we have commence whitelist mint and commence public mint. These are both just saying, okay, contract is live. Um, that way, actually, we, uh, we were able to deploy the contract uh, the night before, maybe a couple nights before, I can't remember. Um, the contract was out there, it was on Ethereum, but it was doing nothing. And we could count on it being, you know, no one's gonna come in and like snipe some NFTs before we want them to because we have this on switch basically. Um, we don't have an off switch because we have the cap on how many um, in total. Uh, well, we do have an off, uh, cap on how many we can mint in total. We kind of rely on that to be the backstop for when we should stop minting. Um, and then there is actually, uh, we'll see a little bit further on, an overall pause. I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so ah, here is uh, the follow up to the OpenSea um, whitelisting, or sorry, the white, uh, OpenSea allowing them to operate on my token. Um, it's basically just saying like, there's a default. Mm, okay, here's actually a keyword to look out for. So there's an override here. Um, you know, in the in the ERC specification, there's a bunch of different um, functions that uh, th that need to be implemented. Um, sometimes we don't want every single one of those from the OpenSea contract to work exactly as they've been implemented. So in this case, uh, we have an override in place. Um, you can see it right here. Basically, this is just saying, instead of using the is approved for all function from OpenSea, um, sorry, from Open Zeppelin, the, the people who make open source contracts, um, we're gonna make a very considered exception and override that function just to make, and, and this is where we actually say like um, the OpenSea contract is gonna be whitelisted for everybody. Uh, we have a current token function in here. This basically just uh, tells whatever, um, whether it's a website or someone just looking directly at the contract, it gives the current number of NFTs that actually have been minted. Um, this is really important. So the base URI, um, the base URI is where it tells every application that wants to look for the artwork or the metadata for your NFT, it tells them where to look. Um, so the base URI just starts out, this is where the API actually lives. Um, and then um, each, if you wanna see the metadata for your specific Toddle Tribe NFT, you could just copy paste this into your browser and add the token ID to the very end. You know, if it's um, 372, you could just type that here. And then uh, if you type, actually, let's do that real quick. Show instead of tell. Uh, so this is actually, this is the metadata for your NFT. And what you're seeing in here is, um, a DNA, this was created um, when we actually created the artwork. Each one got its own unique DNA um, to reflect which attributes are in there. That's part of how we make sure that there's no duplicates in the set. Um, you'll see common things, the name, the description. Um, the most important thing you'll see here is the image itself. So we could copy paste that image and IPFS is a little bit slow. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, there's an image hash. The image hash is important so that um, we can be aware if any changes are made. So the images are not actually stored on the blockchain. There are some projects that are really proud of the fact that they store all of their artwork on the chain. CryptoPunks is probably the best example of this. Um, but the more you put on the chain, the higher the gas cost. And um, there's only so much complexity you can actually do on the Ethereum blockchain. So you can't get a super high level of fidelity by putting all of your art on chain. So 
we're not storing them on chain, but in order to be Web3 still, we're using a decentralized file storage called IPFS, which is the Interplanetary File System um, developed in Toronto. Uh, so these, um, this is actually the image, basically, step one, contract says where to find the metadata, that's this file. Step two, any application that wants to find the image looks for this piece of data here, and you can fetch it like that. Um, and then you'll see the names of the traits. All right, uh, getting back to the contract. We're almost done with the contract. I'm so glad that there's uh, people still engaged in listening to all this technical detail. It makes me very happy as Oh my God, Bradley, you don't even know how engaged they are. We, we got questions, but I wanna get through the statements and then there's a couple couple questions. They're very, we're, we're, you have a captive audience. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, so the next two functions are pause and unpause. So um, this is basically, if something were to go wrong, we could pause the contract. What does that do? It basically turns off all of the functions inside of this contract, except for unpause. Um, you'll see here we have this modifier only owner. So only the right, uh, the default for the owner of the contract is the wallet that deployed the contract. So only I can pause or unpause this. Um, uh, I can change who the owner is um, and will. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll turn that over to, to Web3 Equity as soon as the Mint is complete. Um, pause and unpause. So, you know, if there's a fear of getting hacked, if, if the open Zeppelin contracts get compromised, if some other NFT that's worth, you know, $50 million, something that's worth hackers really going after, um, gets compromised and I see that like they're using the same contracts I did, I'm going to come in here real fast and pause it to make sure that, you know, as other people figure out what that hack was, they're not going to come over here until we can fix whatever is wrong underneath. Um, all right, we're almost done here. So before token transfer, um, what does this do? Uh, I can't remember what this one does. Um, oh, okay, this one. So this one, um, this is this has to do with the, ah, that's what it is. Okay, so because of our upgrade pattern, um, we wanna make sure that we're talking to the right contract. And so this just checks and makes sure that the transaction is actually going to the correct contract before a transfer takes place. Again, just another safety measure. And I'll talk about why we need to figure out which contract in a second, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, authorize upgrade. This is another upgrade focused function. Um, and then uh, we have burn here. So if uh, sometimes tokens, you know, uh, similar to like, well, following economic principles, sometimes they want to decrease their supply, um, hoping to uh, get closer to that demand curve. So if you, if anyone wanted to burn their token, they could do it like this. Really, that what that does? It sends it to zero x zero 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 to forty two zeros. Um, which is a wallet that has no private key. So nobody can do anything with it, but there's like millions of dollars in there because people burned a lot of stuff. Um, token URI, this is how people actually find that base URI that I talked about. Um, another supports interface is just a, a detail about the upgrade and then withdraw all here at the bottom. This is how uh, we withdraw the um, funds that have been collected through the minting process and you can see the payable goes to the owner. So the funds get returned directly to the deploy wallet um, and only to the deploy wallet. Actually, I, I like to make this function public. If someone else wants to pay the transaction gas fee to withdraw all the money to my wallet, go ahead, treat me to the free, free transaction. Um, so that's the contract, that's the customizations. There is a lot more going on under the hood in Open Zeppelin. Um, and for those who are technically inclined, I do encourage you to find them. Uh, they're on GitHub. But um, in any case, that's it for the contract for now. Very quick question on the contract because I do Absolutely. want to make sure with the last you know 15 minutes that we're able to, to dive into this end. But you know, we revealed right after Mint, correct? Mm -hmm. Like there are some other projects that they hold and they, mm -hmm. you know, reveal at a certain date. How did you code the execute to reveal immediately? Yeah. So we actually have, um, 
we, we have an anti-cheat method in place. So um, some projects put all of their metadata up on IPFS, which I showed you, uh, right when they start minting. Um, but what that can allow for is I could write a bot that would go through and look at each one and discover what the rare traits are right when mint is started. And then I can just wait until, you know, I know token 567 is going to be the most valuable in the set. So I'm just going to wait and mint only that one. Um, we don't, and then another process that people go through is they'll wait until everything's minted and then they'll upload everything all at once. We actually have a smart upload feature um, that waits, uh, when someone hits a mint, we do two things. Um, the front end uh, hits the contract to start the mint process that you just saw. The other thing that it does is it tells our metadata service to push that JSON file, the ugly um, text. It puts one at a time up onto IPFS. Um, so that's that's how we do the reveal exactly at the time of the mint, not before and not later. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so let's jump over and take a look at what Tunnel Tribe actually looks like on Etherscan. And I have so many Zoom toolbars. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, real quick, let me show. So this is this is the Etherscan. I'm looking actually here at the wallet address of the deployer. Uh, this is the one that I control. Um, and you'll see here, there's a, a create contract up here. Um, this is the V2 contract being deployed. Um, and you can sort through and just see like all the different transactions that we've done throughout the process. Excuse me. Um, and then this is the actual contract. So you can see all of the mints that have happened on um, the Tuttle tribe from start to finish. Uh, oh, since actually this is only counting since we upgraded. You can click over here and do uh, contract. And this is where you'll actually see two things. This is the complete text of the contract. I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, there's also the contracts ABI. So nerdy detail, but this is basically it's taken the first line of every function with some additional descriptions about it. And this is what any application that wants to interact with uh, our contract basically can get the instruction manual here. Um, and probably don't need to know about the rest of this. Um, then down here is the actual contract. What we've done is um, you saw all the imports in the process of deploying uh, my tool combines all of those contracts into one really big file. It's a huge file, you can see it right here. Um, and so when I actually add this, and this is a very common thing, I'll show you another one in a second here. Um, basically it's called flattening. And so you'll see the contents of all of, not only my contract that I just showed you, but also every single import is also on display here. Um, so if you do like see an override, you can go to uh, Etherscan here and find it. Um, control F works to search the contract so we can take a look and find like the safe mint function. Well, here's the, here's the original safe mint, um, the original safe mint thing. And this is where it says like check, uh, make sure that it is actually a wallet. Um, so that's looking at the contract in Etherscan. One other thing I wanna show um, on Etherscan, you don't need any additional tools. You can actually interact directly with the contract um, on Etherscan. There's a read and there's a write um, for, uh, let's, let me see. So for write, you could mint directly from the contract and there are some projects that do this. Um, I think Loot was one of these contracts actually where they didn't make a website, they didn't make an interface like we have. They just made people come in and like click on the right one. Um, and then uh, add the addresses here and then um, mint directly from Etherscan. So you can interact with the contracts using this tool. Uh, but since we're short on time, I won't get too much farther on that. Um, real quick, I'm just gonna show, this is silkroad.art. This is a, a fine art NFT that was released a couple of weeks ago. Um, and their approach is basically the same where uh, they have all of their contracts flattened out into one single file uh, that you can view here. Um, you can see they're using 
a specific version of open Zeppelin contracts, which they're calling out. And there's like some explanation of why they're using those contracts in particular. Um, and the actual, the functional contract may not uh, be the top one, like here, there, in the flattening process, the, the contract that looks like what I would have showed you is at line 1,189. So um, do use control F if you're ever gonna dive in here. Okay, um, I think that's what I wanna talk about with Etherscan with, with respect to the contract. Yes, um, let's go back and take a look at Etherscan in general. Um, so important things we can see here, we glossed over this a second ago, but we can see again, this is looking at the Silk Road contract, not the tribe. Um, every single, uh, every single um, minter who, who minted. Oh, this is people who are ready to resell it. Um, one really cool thing about Etherscan is that when they're available, it does show uh, it does show the ENS address. Um, if you haven't set up your ENS address, I recommend it. It's pretty cool. Um, although like they're identifiable, I know who this is, I know who this is. Uh, <laughs> so um, let's see, so you can see who set a transaction, uh, transaction hash. So actually, yes, let's look at a transaction. Um, okay, so looking at a transaction, this is really important to be able to do just in general. So when you come in, the transaction hash is a unique identifier um, assigned to each individual transaction. Um, the block Ethereum and other blockchains don't have a sense of time. There's no clock in them. The way they keep track, they only just know like uh, block two com comes after block one, block two comes before block three. Um, and so you can see when you minted by uh, which block you minted on. Um, block confirmations is how many additional blocks were produced um, since, hmm, let me just explain block production. So uh, every 15 seconds-ish, Ethereum produces a new block. Um, so in that 15 second interval, all the transactions that come in get kind of combined and bundled up, processed by the network. And then at the end of that period, uh, when someone, at the end of that period, uh, it's a new block is minted um, for, a lot of technical reasons. That last block is not always considered final. Um, it might take some time for people to detect an error uh, or a hack. So um, a lot of applications, for example, Coinbase makes you wait 15 um, block confirmations past the time that you send money to your Coinbase um, because they wanna make sure that everyone is, there's not gonna be anyone blowing the whistle on you. Blowing the whistle is a technical process. There's bots that are doing the verification all the time. Um, so let's see. There is a timestamp. The timestamp comes from Etherscan, not from Ethereum blockchain. Um, there's the from. Again, we're looking at the person's ENS handle. There's the address on the preview. Um, and the to. And that's so basically the from is who's initiating this transaction and who's in receiving this transaction on the to side. It's this contract we were just looking at. Um, there was no value on this. Uh, let's see. It doesn't say here which function was called, but I think this was probably like getting this ready to sell on Etherscan. Uh, sorry, on OpenSea. So listing causes a transaction, one. Um, uh, there's no value, but when there's a mint, um, you would actually see value here. Here's a transaction fee. This is... Uh, Another example of how like the extremely long numbers of ether um, under the hood, they're actually not gonna show this decimal if you're in the coding environment. And then a conversion of what that cost at the time, which is really convenient. Um, here's the gas price. That's really important. Um, gas is running a little higher this week than it has in the past few weeks, probably because uh, the market's a little bit turbulent. And then the price at that moment, which also is really helpful. Um, some more deeper details. Here you can see exactly us, oh, set approval for all. So this is a transaction that we have, a, when I talked about the contract white listing, the OpenSea contract, this is the exact uh, transaction that we are preventing you from doing if you wanna list on OpenSea. So for each one individually of your title tribes that you may want to list on OpenSea, we're saving you $10 with our little shortcut. Um, 
let's see. Uh, I think so. Gas fees. There's there's a base and there's a max and there's a max priority. So right now th the way it works is um, for so in that block that 15 second period uh, there's a lot of people competing for time uh, to get processed on the network and so everyone has there's basically an auction that happens really fast to get your transaction included. Um, so you submit like what your your base and your max gas that you want to allow are and then there's a little tip here uh, that you can optionally add. Uh, it looks like this person was trying to avoid some uh, network traffic. Gas was at 80, so they just wanted to make sure this happens right away. And then this is the actual, uh, the, the hex, uh, hex conversion of what got called under the hood. Um, so that is Etherscan in a nutshell. I'm running short on time, so it kind of blew, uh, let's see. That's everything I wanted to talk about, though. Um, okay, so. Actually, that might be perfect timing. I think um, ready to uh, take questions that may have come up. It looks like a lot of activity in chat. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna bubble up um, two questions. Uh, one topic is really around gas and um, what the gas is actually doing. Um, someone asked, you know, does that gas actually go to the node? Um, mm. or does that go, um, to the, the proof of work consensus model? Like where does it actually go? So kind of yeah. gas as a topic and then the other around IP, right. And I remember when we were creating the contract, this was something we discussed. I want to give IP rights to the owners. Like, where do we actually see that in contracts? And if they're thinking mm. about buying other projects, how might people learn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, with respect to the gas, um, in the process of creating a block in the proof of work scheme, um, all of the different computers that are running the network are not only processing the transactions that come in, they're also doing a search um, for an extremely complicated factoring problem. Uh, we'll put it that way. So it's not too, again, not too different than like your basic algebra it's just like intentionally a very, very tricky process um, to make it slow. So there's you know tens of thousands of computers that are trying to solve this problem all at once. The first one that solves it is the considered, uh, they get elected to be the block producer. It's the technical way to describe it. So um, the first, uh, the first computer that finds the valid solution to this factoring problem um, gets the reward for that block, which is mm, a lot of the gas from that particular one. So there's a little bit of a lottery involved in mining, um, tens of thousands of computers, and you just really have to hope to be the one in any given block that solves the problem first, and then you get the reward. Um, I won't talk too much more about mining unless people really want. There's one other important detail. Um, Ethereum in the uh, last summer, I believe, uh, made a very significant change to the core architecture, which in each block, they're also burning some of that gas fee. Uh, so they're actually reducing the total of supply with each individual, um, with each individual uh, transaction that comes through. So um, the more gas gets spent, the more the supply gets reduced. Uh, if anyone is aware of the, the other side mint that happened on Saturday, there was a major gas war, huge gas war. And in the process, um, uh, one of my fine art friends was like, it was the greatest performance art piece ever. They burned $70 million worth of ETH just in the mint. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Um, oh my gosh. So <laughs> that means more did go to the block producers, the, the, the miners, but um yeah. Uh, oh, and the second question was about IP. So IP, um, the there's only so much that the contracts can do uh, to govern IP. So this is where the um, the messy implementation between pure digital code is law mindset and traditional law mindset comes in. So we haven't seen like that many. We haven't seen any. Let's say high level like DMCA lawsuits. Um, but I know some people who are just like ready and roaring to enforce their IP rights uh, on, and they're like looking for people to sue. Um, so 
right now there's not a bunch of that that's regulated on the chain. Um, you know, we put these assets on IPFS. That's kind of a gesture that we want them to be decentralized and kind of Creative Commons-ish. Um, that would be specified somewhere on the website. And in fact, I believe this is specified in the terms of service now. Um, our terms of service would be the place to look for that um, or, or whatever project. Um, although I do think that in the next 18 months, let's say, it will become more common for projects to hide their metadata behind some kind of server. So instead of making it really easy, like I was able to copy paste the URL into my browser and, and just load it right away, they probably there probably will be start to be some like guardrails put around that process. And actually, I think this is a great plug for, we have another event on May 23rd. Uh, and one of, well, we actually have a, a lot of great uh, blockchain focused lawyers in our group, uh, but this is one of the topics we're diving into is really IP um, and, and blockchain technology and what is what is currently happening, what is maybe coming down the pike, what things we should think about. So um, that event is for Tuttle Tribe holders. So would love, you know, for folks to take advantage of that and dive into the, the legal side. Um, because I know this code is law is something that developers say often, right? To really refer to like that, that is the instruction set. Whereas there, there are actual legal implications. So we'll dive into that on Monday, May 23rd for anyone who's uh, a Tuttle Tribe holder to attend that event. Um, so we have about one minute left. I don't know, Bradley, if you're looking at the questions here, if there's one that you think you wanna tackle in this last minute, um, before I do a quick wrap up. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of scanning through. Um, okay, so here's an interesting one. Um, someone, uh, Vitalik, thank you, Vitalik. So honored for you to join, uh, Vitalik. I know, Vitalik, Vitalik V, yep, yep, that's who that is. <laughs> um, can you explain how the other side drop over the weekend receives so much negative reaction? Um, so again, like, uh, it comes out of that process of, of bidding for time inside each block. Um, and when there is something really popular, I think there were, um, I can't remember exactly, but I think I saw maybe 10 to 50,000 people uh, on the whitelist for the other side mint. So you have all these people in the queue trying to get into that little 15 second block space um, that, and it's on auction. So that's how it gets driven up. And then there's another thing on Ethereum, again, like, the the part of the beauty but also part of the downside of a system that is decentralized and equal access for all is that means that uh the the no good doers also have equal access um so there are sometimes it's people who actually are running mining the network um that might have to uh that might be trying to increase the auction price there's also other people who might just want to be making some money more in terms of like um, making trades on Uniswap or something like that. People watch transactions coming in. They say, oh, I can make some money on this. They'll submit a transaction with a higher gas fee, buy that asset, drive the price up for that other person, and then uh, dump it at the higher price after the person's thing has cleared. So the gas can get complex. Um I just don't do anything unless gas is like at a price that I want to. Um, and I really try to avoid gas wars. Um, let's see, so the contract actually, I was- I wanna make sure that we wrap, because uh, I know that a lot of people are, are, are dropping off. They probably have calls right at 11. Um, and I think this is a really great opportunity for folks who are you know new to getting to know us, to understand the value of what it means to be part of Web3 Equity and what it means to hold a Tuttle Tribe. So be sure if you don't hold one of these yet that you are going to the website, you are joining our community, um, our NFTs are 0 0.05 Ethereum, um, which with today's ETH prices is, I don't know, around what, 150, 160 US dollars. Um, these are very approachable, you know, NFTs to own for the uh, wonderful value that you get of this learning experience. So um, please make sure that you, you join the community. If you're already part of the community, you know, please make sure you spread the word to other folks around what we are doing, what we are building, and um, you know, stay in touch with Bradley if you, know, you have other projects, uh, if you have other Web3 development needs. That's exactly what he does, and clearly very 
trustworthy and transparent. Thanks. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you, everyone. And this will live up on the website. So be sure that uh, if you need to watch it again, you head over to the website. We will get that up there uh, later today. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much, Bradley. <laughs>